Season 2, Episode 9. You're listening to UX Podcast, coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. Helping the UX community explore ideas and share knowledge for over a decade. We are your hosts, James Roy Lawson. And Pat Axboom. We have listeners in countries and territories all over the world, from China to Cameroon. And today we have a link show. Two articles found on the internet. We unpack them, we talk about them, we discuss them, and uh, try to figure out what how we feel about these topics. And uh, the two articles today are: the first one is "Don't uh, Don't Get Stuck in Discovery with Insights No One Asked For" by Matt, uh, Martin Sandstrom. He's a product and service designer based in the UK. He's, he's been doing this for a long time. And despite his sw- very Swedish sounding name, I'm, now I feel like, a, yeah, we, we're saying Martin, but maybe we should say Martin based on, he's, based on the he's fact Swedish. that he's Swedish. He is, he is Swedish. Swedish, right. Yeah. But I, so I'm he's, supposed he's to everybody Martin. calls him Martin. <laughs> he's getting Martin. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Oh, and yeah, the second article today is UX Strategy. What is it? By Eddie Rich. Yep, experienced strategist and designer with 20 years of experience building digital products. And um, and also a someone... long time friend of the show, we have to say. Yes, we yes, he's been on the show um or what's that now? Um, 7 years ago and we met him even longer ago than that. Mm. Article 1 by Martin Sandström. Don't get stuck in discovery with insights no one asked for. Uh and I think there is a lot to talk about here, but let's get to the gist of what Martin is saying. Essentially, as designers, we want to do good work. We want to do things the right way. We want to follow the design thinking process. We want to do the correct research. We actually do want to find out if we are solving the right problem. So when we get problems handed to us, we feel that we need to figure out, well, is this the thing that we should be working on or should we be doing more research? And in effect, we spend a lot of time doing more research. And what Martin is saying here is that sometimes we spend a bit too much time doing the research and trying to figure out if we're solving the right problem rather than helping the person who came to us in the first place solve their problem in the best possible time frame from their perspective. So there's like a communication issue. There's a clash here. Yeah, he's also talking about the, the fact that you that whole thing where we get high hopes as designers. You, you kind of, you've done the discovery, you found things, and you go, oh, look at this, we've got to fix that. And, and sometimes those things that we discover are big asks. They're, they're you know, they're going to be a lot of effort to get over the line because they're not as he puts it, they're not low-hanging fruit. They're not small tweaks and changes that you can get over the line quite easily. They're big things. Um, so, so he's talking about being pragmatic in oh, your discovery work and what you try to do. Exactly, not doing too much. I have to read this quote. I love this paragraph. Uh, so off we go to run workshops, create hypotheses and research plans. We create how might we statements and test prototypes. It's messy and chaotic. And although the unknown scares the heck out of us, we feel so good about uncovering the untold truths about the industry we're helping. Uh, and this feels so good because this is what we really want to spend time on. But as he's, he then goes on to say, in the meantime, our business stakeholders are starting to get impatient. <laughs> uh, and I think... There's so much here that I that I feel I identify with because I also always want to do the right thing, whereas I'm I, I can always become acutely aware that doing the right thing means that I can will uncover issues that will never get fixed uh, because there is a time frame in most projects I work with, and there is a specific piece of a solution or product or service that I am working with, but I will often uncover things that are beyond that, which is part of UX to go beyond what I'm currently working on to understand the context of that. But oftentimes what I, what's been happening is that, well, 
there's so much information, there's so much research uh, output that we are not getting or solving the, the problems that we were asked to solve. Well, perhaps as quickly as we could. But also you've you've got the the situation where you know when you've been part of a discuss, discovery process and you have discovered things and you've become enlightened then you know you are you're the you're ahead of the curve you're at the front of the pack here now yes and mm. an, an organization especially the the larger ones then you know they're an established system they're a thing and it's it's moving it's continuing it's doing stuff it's got strategies it's got plans it's got you know five year you know strategic goals and so on it's got shareholders stakeholders it's got all this stuff going on and and you're there at the forefront of this discovery and you know you've had the light bulb mo- light bulb moment and you've thought my word we need to do something about this mm. but you can't just slam on the brakes you can't you know you're not going to be able to just you know, rip everything else up and rebuild it and put it and you know, put the world to rights. Exactly. You, you're going to need to, oh, you know, wait, I suppose wait, that's maybe not the right phrase. You're going to have to, if you really think that discovery is important, then you're going to have to be in this for the long haul and you're going to have to work on how do you get the organization to, to move to where you are in your enlightened state of, of exactly. understanding. What's and then on? it comes down to communication. It come down, comes down to helping others understand what you're trying to achieve, what you're seeing. Because failing to do that, you will get the type of disillusionment that Martin talks about in the article where where people, when you present your findings, they're going like, well, we know that that's a problem. We can't really do anything about it or there's no budget to solve it this year or whatever else excuse they may come up with because they don't truly – they aren't enlightened in the way that you that you're saying, James. They haven't seen it yet. But for me, that's kind of a communication issue as well. But it, Martin is correct in that. Well, maybe we won't be able to solve this right now. But then I agree with you, James. If you you have to be in it for the long haul, yeah, you have and, to and he's... talk about these things over the over time, over a broader broader space of time. Yeah, and Martin, he's he's he's. Um, idea here is that um, by by respecting the the project goals and where they're coming from and where you are in the project and and finding the the smallest most substantial insight that was the biggest impact on this on the situation, then he's he's aiming to build trust and and grow a reputation over time, yes. which presumably will will allow him in his organisation to to make a bigger impact further forward. Exactly. Yes, so it's, exactly. It, so I agree with him as well. <laughs> yeah, there is there's something to be said for the fact that you you you, it's a balance as always. You need to figure out the balance. How much do I do with each part? And sometimes we're trying to do too much. Uh, is is essentially what he's saying. One thing I did think about though in reading through this pair is is this um, a dilemma, I guess, about. Um, if you, well, the situation you might be in is that you are, as a designer in this team, this project, you're enabling something to continue yep. that you've effectively discovered should stop. Hmm. So, so you end up with, faced with the question, um, is, is making the wrong thing slightly less wrong, is, is that as good as it gets in this situation? Hmm. I, I thought about that as well. It really becomes an ethics dilemma in the end in that should I quit this job if I fail to see any purpose in it based on the fact that I think we should be doing other things or should I be spending time to help people see what I see? Uh, if that's the right thing, I mean, you always have to be a, a, a bit open to the fact that you may be not seeing the right things either. You're always discovering new stuff. Uh, so so there are many paths to to dealing with something like this. And I completely agree with you, James, that in the end, if we're in the, constantly enabling the things that we don't believe in, we're not going to be happy at work and we will be contributing to something that we think is doing making things worse. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot, you know, like you say, different, there's, there's different routes you can follow and, you know, doing... Um, just getting on with your job is one path. Um, getting on with uh, making small differences to hopefully make a bigger difference later is another path. And then oh, the revolutionist, as in saying, no, we've got to stop. We've got to do something else. 
that's the that's the big one and you 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 might find yourself in that one anyway definitely having to change job if you're not getting anywhere at the speed that suits you and makes you feel good right yeah right and people different people will choose different paths because different people are in different contexts and and have different experiences so just but the important thing then is talk about it find someone to talk about these issues with because if you don't have someone an ally to be open to so that you can talk about the things that are bothering you, then you will definitely struggle a lot. So I think just writing articles like this can help get things out there in the open and to talk them about them a bit more. Yeah. I, I mean, one thing I, I noted down as well was um, the the thing about doing like a backstory check. I mean, it's something I, I try to do when I'm doing uh, analysis and, um, and and research is, you know, I want to know what's the story behind this, you know, request for me to do a certain bit of research um and in some ways that's that's, that's one of the re- really important things you need to deal with and what martin seems to have, have got as well here that he's he's realized he's become self he's become aware of his organization and he's he's understood the organization and and that that there is a real key thing he he's he's looked at the the landscape he's 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 working within and 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 got it um and that that i think is what we can all do you've got to you've got to have that uh, where of all to to look at your organization and understand the backstory um so so you better frame it gives you a better lens to do your um to make your own decisions and do your own work yeah and check your own expectations and the expectations of the people you're working with and moving on to the to the uh, second article i think we will actually reference back to this because i, I feel there's a bit of an overlap perhaps uh, with I, LA's I reckon article. we can connect these yeah mm-hmm. um, so article 2 um, this is ux strategy what is it um, and it's by um, eddie rich um, who we've we've known for a fair few years um, and well to be honest I, I i stumbled across it i didn't actually see ed himself promoting this i, I stumbled on stumbled on this um, article um, um oh awesome out, outside of the of the regular ways i would see um posts and comments from um, from eddie which is which is quite fun um to discover stuff um a little bit more um, randomly i guess um but basically um like so many, Eddie's, Eddie's fed up with, with UX um, being misused and, and, and misunderstood, um, particularly within the space of, of UX strategy. Um, so what Eddie proposes in this article, I'm giving away the punchline a bit now, but I think it's, it's worth to do at the start. Um, he's proposing saying um, experience strategy um, instead of UX strategy. Because um, what he's seen is that this helps him articulate what he's working on um, in a way that makes sense to business executives, the business as a whole, or um, our product teams. Um, now, what Eddie does in the article, he he starts off um, quite sensibly um, going back to, to going back to basics and trying, like so many of us have done in, over the years, define user experience. Mm-hmm. Um, Eddie, of course, he goes back to um, oh, Nielsen Norman Group um, and Don Norman who by and large are attributed with being the people who came up with the phrase user experience, Don Norman, of his time as Apple. Um, and um, he, he puts that out on the website there. He said, user experience encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. Mm. Um, and he goes on to, to look about um, what that means um, and um, also how it ties in with um some of the examples that we use like the particular example he uses is of um disneyland um which he says maybe a lot of people would see disneyland as a product um but he says well no if you if you look at disneyland um actually as an experience um that is underpinned and enabled and supported by a series of other experiences of products um then then you start to realize that the the, the the experience is the thing rather than the products. Right. The product is part of the experience and not the other way around, is what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's trying to correct the lens in this article about yeah, or shift the shift the lens a little bit so that you're you know, rather than focus on your product and, and, and just the experience of that particular 
um, bit of user interaction, um, trying to get you to you know, widen your lens and go, look, your experience encompasses all these things. It's kind of, you know, using the Disneyland example, it's, it's everything from the moment you buy your ticket all the way through for, to when you walk through the gate to when you kind of like share an experience and maybe as a family doing a certain activity when you're actually there. Um, memories afterwards. I mean, everything ties in together to be that, that experience. Um, so, and I think this is really important in the sense that what he's also criticizing is how when people speak of UX today, it's mostly digital and digital interfaces. But it's really, really key to to the concept of UX that it's about so much more than interfaces. Yeah, exactly. And um, he he goes on to eventually um, put forward his own definition of um well, I say user UX strategy, but actually his definition is now for experience strategy um, to remove the product mindset um, and to... Um, but also because, as he like says, it. because UX has been so misused and misunderstood, is what he's saying. So he's going to switch it out. Yeah. And because he is talking to people in his organization, the C-suite, the execs and so on, where... I mean, they don't get UX. They don't know what it is. They think it is just the digital aspect. And mm. to achieve your goals, your strategic goals, you can't just focus on the digital side of it. You need to be the the whole. It needs to be the whole thing, um, including the branding, the you know the company goals, and and, and so on. So he he comes um, to the well to the phrase um, or definition. Experience strategy is a vision and evolving long-term plan of outcomes to align every customer touch point with your brand position as part of the business strategy. Mm. That's again, that would be Eddie's drop mic moment and, you know, where he <laughs> leaves us and walks out. Um, but um, it, I, I think, you know, me personally, um, I mean, I, what he says, Eddie says, and what he writes here is is, is really good, and I really like it. Um, but I actually, I actually don't think it matters about changing it from UX to experience strategy. Um, I actually think you could probably call it floppity floop strategy. Uh, I don't and, think you can, you know, James. I'm I can't. I just did. Say, I, I don't. No, think I, I am. We're, we're going to call this floppity floppity floop strategy now. Um, no, the, the, I've been silly, of course, but the, the thing is that Eddie, it's, it's the key here. The key thing here is relationships and, and trust and relationships. And what Eddie has realized here is that experience strategy is something, like he says himself, allowed him to articulate better what he wanted to achieve to his organization and to build understanding, build that trust, and ultimately success. So what you're saying really is that uh, you can say anything you want based on what context you're in. So there is some organization out there where floppity floop strategy will work. Yes, that's yeah. that. That is what. Mm. Yeah, in an infinitely large, um, you know, design world, then there will be an organization where um, floppity floop does work. And this does tie us back Douglas to the first. Adams, it makes sense. <laughs> well, this this ties us back to the first article. Where Martin yes, had a similar kind of thing. I mean, there, w- there will be. An, I mean, in his organisation, maybe, maybe you know, experience strategy would have helped him better rather than being kind of like double down on. Or product strategy obviously didn't work for him because product product strategy ended up being too. You know, he was locked in product strategy and he wanted to break out of that. But he was doing incremental changes to to make the change. Whereas Eddie, rather than kind of like you know ignoring some of the um, the, the the bigger things that have come up during discovery. He went, no, I'm going to fix this by changing it to experience strategy and get myself, you know, a better relationship, more trust with the executives in the business to achieve more as we're going on. And he obviously did this by understanding his organization as well and their needs. This is what I need to say to help people understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. So So uh, it's almost like this is this is one of the paths that that Martin could take as well. So it's almost like a response to his. Yeah, exactly. I think here, you know, Eddie, Eddie has chosen as a design leader mm. um, this particular path, you know, um, to have that good understanding of the organization, how it works as a larger system. Now, he's, he, wants to, he wants to play with the machine. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm putting words into Martin's text here now, Martin wanted to be a better cog. Right. Exactly. And deliver is, as, as, as per promised. So yeah. 
that's also Which, sort but, of an ethical viewpoint. I mean, you, you want right. this from me, and I promise to help you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just different ways of framing it. Mm. I have to say, though, because you brought up the floppity floop. <laughs> As I do. <laughs> uh, from my experience, I'm feeling more and more that UX – can sometimes be a hindrance and, and using experience as a, as a placeholder for that instead can work better uh, in communication settings. But of course, you're absolutely right. It will depend on the organization. But in, in general terms, I try to avoid UX because people tend to think, well, like, oh, so you design buttons. Uh, mm. And now I'm almost finding myself, well, I'm almost using that term the way others are using it because I'm falling into the trap of ad- adopting the terminology that, of others as well. Mm. Which is part of doing UX. <laughs> it is, and we've seen. I mean, there was a there was things that we saw I saw recently about. Um, um, it was it was Jacob Nielsen, wasn't it? I think it was it was talking about how how the names of things change over time. Um, names of things change over time, and he 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 was using about you know UX and then like customer experience and other kind of things, and and um, and that got like jumped on a fair bit by saying, well, no, customer experience is actually older than user experience. Um, you know, so you you end up in the kind of battle of terminology uh, when you right. do all these definitions. The, Those battles um, are never good. Yeah. Yeah. So you you know whose whose history is the oldest? Um, and 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 you know, if you come from an organisation where um, you know, the the customer experience side of things has been um, a practice you've followed maybe since the eighties, um, then then you're going to maybe frown on UX as like a you know annoying little sibling that kind of turned up and think they own the place. Um, whereas if you're in a startup from, from, you know, the last 10 years, then, you know, you won't have been part of all that, um, you know, customer experience stuff of the eighties and you won't know what it's about really. So your startup is not going to, not going to understand that angle. Right. So the definition will be I can imagine that people that are reading Eddie's article are just thinking, well, he's talking about service design. Isn't that what he's talking about? (laughs) So, I mean, it's, we couldn't, you can never win. It's impossible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so 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 the way to win is just accepting that you know, every organisation will have a different view on these things, and you've got to. You, I think you probably you normally say you've got to you, you've got to be listening. Exactly. Be, yeah. Don't and, say and anything. You, just listen and see see what happens, and that works really really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's discovery of your own discovery. So, I mean, you know, you you you're again. You've got to you've got to take that time to to listen to your own organisation, um, to understand you know what 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 language do they use, what what habits, um, what um, uh, what exists already, and what can I what can I influence, what can't I influence? Um, I mean, we you, you're doing your own UX project on your so own, many like people we've had on the show yeah over the years they've, they've all they've so many have said this that you have to apply design principles to your own organization to 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 cope better and and, and produce better products yeah kim goodwin wasn't it we talked about um um, um the organization of values um with her a few years ago um yeah. going along these exact lines um it's um I mean, this is where the frustration lies, I think, for a lot of us. Um, not- because it is undefined and it is evolving constantly. And uh, sometimes, uh, well, like you and I have discussed as well, sometimes we can get frustrated with how this terminology changes over time. And then we realize, well, a lot of the people who they weren't around for the for the time when it was invented and nobody has documented this in a way that is coherent. And there are so many different organizations teaching UX and different teachers with their own with their own idea of what this is. So, of course, it's going to be very disparate. Mm. But um, and at the same time, it, it's good to have people coming in who don't have certain baggage with them. It is, exactly, yeah. Um, you know, that, that's your chance for, you know, for... for for making change happen, having a clean sheet and maybe getting rid of some of the stuff you right, don't and, and really want to have get, anymore. And get rid of people like us. And, and, and so we, <laughs> we, need to, we need to shut up more, really, uh, about these things, I, I think, uh, and be more open to the, the changes that come. Oh, you see, now that almost sounds like you look, you've been a little bit mean towards Eddie now at the end there by saying, Eddie, you need to shut up and it's not a point about renaming no, but it. He's, he's working within the con- <laughs> well, he's working within a specific context yes. and he's explaining that context and he's solving the problem yeah. within his space. 
Uh, whereas what I'm talking about now is all these arguments with, with people with definitions and the, the older people saying, well, that's not right because back in my day, well, that doesn't really matter because now is now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I know the point you're trying to make. I'm just trying to yeah. cause a fight. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Eddie, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Recommended listening. And, you know, I think we we do this way too often now. I, I, I work out some recommended listening before we record. And then we start talking. And then yeah. things come up. And I end up with more recommended listening than we started with. So now we've mentioned... Yeah, there were lots we've of things we referenced here, wasn't weren't there? Kim yeah. now, in particular, we've, um, yeah. we've, we've mentioned, which I, um, oh, I... I will add the episode number to the show notes there. Um, mm. But um, no, what I actually did pull out um, was... Um, Episode 88, which is an absolute classic, where it's me, you, and Jared Spool. Um, talk about UX strategy and UX research. Um, is that the one where he talks about listening to us while he's at the gym? Yeah, and, and the sheep. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, that was my biggest takeaway when I realized, whoa, so people actually what, the sheep? To you us. took the sheep? No. <laughs> <laughs> you said you didn't touch the sheep. <laughs> Now people do have to listen to that episode. They do have to listen. You've no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, dear. If you want me and Per as part of your next conference or event or in-house training, um, then, you know, just get in touch. Um, Email hey at euxpodcast.com and uh, maybe we can help you get to the bottom of what articulates best for you and your organization. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. James, what did one hat say to the other? I don't know, Poe. What did one hat say to the other? You go on ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>